Over the past decade, the use of automation in the workplace has increased by over 10%, compounding year over year. Some estimates suggest that up to 20 million American jobs might be replaced by automation by 2030. But will automation take away our jobs or create new, more valuable ones? Our next guest, Daryl West, has been studying the relationship between robots, AI, and the public policy needed to avert a potential disaster. Daryl is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute Center for Technology Innovation. Working previously as an academic, he's the author of The Future of Work, Robots, AI, and Automation, and Turning Point, Policymaking in the Era of Artificial Intelligence. He's been studying how technology has been impacting our places of work since the Industrial Revolution, the lessons we've learned, and the warning signs on the horizon. So, Daryl, um, I always am fascinated when somebody's talking about something that's rather forward-leaning. How do you get interested in something like this? So what, what drove you uh, down this road, so to speak? I got interested in the topic of future work just because I study digital technology. And we know that there are so many changes taking place in that area. Technology is driving change in virtually every sector. And so one day I was just thinking about, well, what are going to be the ramifications for workers? What's going to be the impact on the workforce? So I wrote a book entitled The Future of Work, uh, delved into the topic, lots of interesting uh, angles. But uh, certainly it's a topic young people are very interested in. It's like everybody wants to know, how am I going to adapt to this new digital era that is emerging. How am I going to adapt? But then you also get the people who are like, I mean, the robots are going to take my job. I mean, you must hear that all the time. So what do you say to people who are like terrified of this bright new future, so to speak? Well, the robots are going to take some jobs, so there is a rational basis for people's fear and their uh, anxiety. But there's a lot that people can do to deal with their own uh, situation. I mean, what they have to realize is there are so many new technologies that are popping up, AI, machine learning, data analytics, uh, chat, GBTs, kind of the latest uh, thing that people are uh, talking about. All these things are going to affect the workforce, so what people need to understand is any job that has a big routine and repetitive component is going to get automated. So if you are in one of those professions, you are at risk. Uh, you know, whether it's an accountant, uh, there are radiologists uh, uh, who are at risk in the sense that there's uh, algorithms that can now read x-rays and CAT scans and kind of diagnose them at a very high degree of accuracy. So people need to assess where they are now, what is the likelihood of automation coming into their area. If their job is going to get automated, they're going to have to upgrade their job skills. They're going to have to learn new uh, skills if they want to remain employed. We hear a lot of these phrases, um, AI, machine learning, you, you ticked them all off, but I don't think most people really understand. Um, can you kind of walk us through each one, uh, maybe start with AI? Well, just to give uh, an example of how AI is starting to come into the finance area. So it used to be that bank officers would meet customers who wanted loans or mortgages, and they would kind of assess their credit worthiness and, you know, have they repaid their bills. Now, banks and other financial institutions are using algorithms to determine credit worthiness. Uh, they look at your income. Uh, they uh, look at your uh, past loan repayments, but they might also look at your social media profile. Like, do you seem to be a reliable individual? Uh, do people seem to uh, trust you? Or are you embedded in uh, networks? And so algorithms can take information from a variety of different areas and make decisions. So in the finance area, they're making decisions on loans. In the education area, uh, colleges are using them to determine of the students they admit to their university, how many of them are actually going to show up, like they need to meet a certain enrollment number in order to uh, maintain their financial viability. So you can really go area by area. Algorithms are coming in, uh, AI is coming in, and people need to understand this is going to be transformative for the workforce. It doesn't mean everybody's going to lose their job, but people need to pay attention to these trends and figure out what will be the consequences for them in particular. The switch over to AI has already begun across many facets of our daily lives, even if we don't realize it. 
In 2021 alone, Visa's AI-based fraud detection system prevented $26 billion in stolen credit card transactions. By comparing customer trends to attempted transactions, the credit issuer can determine the likelihood of each transaction's authenticity. It's not going to be a light switch that goes on and off, though. Like one day you're, you've got a job, next day you're gone. It, 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 these transformations come over time. What are, it, it, but it sort of is a tsunami headed your way. What are things people should be watching for? Well, people should understand that over the last two to three years during the pandemic, technology innovation accelerated. Like a lot of people moved to remote work. Companies did start to automate things that humans used to do. But what they should realize is over the next five years, the pace of technological innovation is really going to accelerate very dramatically. So people think that the last few years has been a rapid pace. It's going to get uh, much faster. And so even though it's not a light switch is going to flip on and off, it's going to happen probably faster than many people realize. It's going to have ramifications for jobs much more quickly than people realize. So what I tell people is regardless of their age, people need to constantly upgrade their job skills. You know, the old model used to be we would invest in education up to about age 25, and then after that people were on their own. People today are going to have to upgrade their job skills at ages 30, 40, 50, and 60, virtually throughout their lifetimes. And people at ages 30, 40, 50, and 60 become more inured into, I don't want to change, I don't want to adapt. Um, but they have to change that attitude. Absolutely. I mean, sometimes people in their 50s and 60s have been doing things a certain way for decades. They don't want to adapt, but those are people who are going to be at risk because if people don't adapt, like they are not going to be able to resist the uh, technology tsunami that, that you uh, eloquently uh, described. So they have to understand the change is going to happen. Uh, they are not going to be able to stop the digital change. Uh, technology makes things more efficient and more effective, uh, but it can also help people do their job. In a certain respect, it may actually lead to higher quality jobs because you can automate the boring or dangerous part of jobs and then free people for the more creative things. So people, I understand people's fears about technology, but they should understand that in some respects, Technology may just take away the boring jobs and free people for much better jobs. And I've heard that uh, as well, and perhaps maybe not the, uh, the 10, 12 hour days either uh, in some respects, that you may be able to do something more creative, uh, more interesting, more fun, and you don't have to like beat your brains in doing it. It may be the case that the old model of people having to work 50 or 60 hours a week may give way to a more leisure-based society. Uh, that if we adopt certain kinds of public policies that help people adapt to this change, that people will actually be free to pursue their hobbies. You know, a lot of people have a job, but then they may be interested in art or music or culture or dancing or whatever. They may end up having more time to be able to pursue those interests. So if we handle this technology revolution the right way, we all can end up better off. But of course, that is going to require require a public policy response that helps people uh, make these uh, changes. Uh, and of course, it's an open question as to whether uh, you know, we're going to end up in a better world or a worse world. Daryl sees the coming of AI and automation as being similar to the changes experienced by the world at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. As the world worked to develop factories and cities, living conditions across the world deteriorated. But with time and policy changes, the world would awaken to a new era of education, culture, and art. Daryl warns, it is these lessons we must take to heart if we are to reap the rewards of the AI revolution, while learning from and avoiding the mistakes of the 19th century. Well, public policy, too, always seems to be very slow uh, in responding uh, to change. Do you see uh, work afoot? I mean, are there some people who recognize what's happening and are trying to adapt, or, or are you kind of disappointed to the public policy response so far? 
I am disappointed in the public policy response uh, so far. Uh, certainly in the United States, uh, that is the case. There's some European countries that are more forward uh, looking and are having these types of uh, conversations. But, you know, in the last few campaigns, I keep hoping that politicians will, you know, they say they want to talk about the future, but they're really not talking about it in a very concrete way of technology is going to accelerate, it's going to change the nature of jobs. How can we respond? How can we help people? Like, we don't want people to be left behind as uh, the technology revolution uh, takes place. So what I like to remind people of is 100 years ago, the United States went through a major transition from an agrarian to an industrial era, and it was certainly very disruptive, uh, But and it took decades to really work through that, but we adopted new types of public policies, like Social Security, unemployment compensation, uh, government aid to uh, colleges and universities, uh, building new kinds of infrastructure to uh, facilitate uh, factory life. We made all sorts of changes that then put the United States and other countries did the same thing, put them in a much stronger position uh, for the future. Today, we're going through a similar change in moving from an industrial to a digital world. We need to change our public policies to help people adapt to this new world. When you started on this project, uh, was your knowledge base limitless, or were there things no. that <laughs> I just kind of walk us through that process? I mean, was it, were there things that just kind of you're like, oh my gosh, I never even thought of this? I mean, t talk to us about and and how do you go about writing that story? Who do you go to to talk to? Well, I had a pretty good background in digital technology and, and the various changes that were taking place. What I had to learn uh, and what I had to figure out uh, in my future workbook was what does this mean for workers and what does it mean for the workforce? How's it going to change the nature of jobs and how can people react to that? So I had to do a lot of reading in the education area. Uh, I also found it helpful just from a historical standpoint to go back and look at past revolutions and how people adapted to them, what kind of skills uh, people uh, needed, because that can actually help inform the current period. It actually made me more optimistic about our ability to cope. Like some people worry about the robots taking over and humans losing control and you know, ending up in a dystopian world. I'm actually not so worried about that because we have the means to control the technology, we can control the robots, uh, we write the algorithms, uh, but what we need to do is make sure that there are human guardrails in place with all the new technologies so that we get the benefits uh, without getting the risks. AI advancements are happening in real time, and so far there are no clear winners and losers. Only a handful of nations are experimenting and investing in the technology. China and the United States are at the forefront. But each nation is approaching the development and adoption of AI differently. For Daryl, that presents a global opportunity for learning and cooperation, but it could also threaten more tensions. I was in China, obviously, before the pandemic at a, at a conference, and, and everybody was talking about 5G and AI and machine learning, and, and it seems like innovation was, it, it was embraced. They were talking about it, and it's like, it's gonna change everything, we gotta get out in front on this. So you see some countries where maybe it's not discussed as much, like you were saying here in terms of public policy in the United States. Are there countries that you look at and you say, oh, they get it, they see what's coming, and some that are kind of behind the eight ball who should be moving more quickly? Well, the two leaders in many technologies today actually is the United States and China, uh, sometimes in different areas. I mean, I've been to uh, China a number of times. They have really excelled in mobile technology in general and in developing apps for phones uh, like uh, WeChat. Uh, WeChat kind of combines a lot of different functions that different American companies provide, but it's all in one platform. So you can you know, book your restaurant appointment, you can do e-commerce online, there's a social component, there's a, a phone uh, component. And so they are, China's actually ahead of the United States in some of those areas, particularly uh, those related to uh, mobile technology. AI is gonna be the big area. Each of those countries are investing vast uh, amounts of money in that. Uh, the change is going to accelerate very uh, rapidly. 
Other countries that are uh, doing very well, uh, South Korea is a leader, uh, Singapore uh, is a leader. There's some European uh, countries uh, that are uh, doing well, but in general, I think Europe has lagged. Like when you think of the big tech companies that are dominating uh, the global world, there actually aren't very many European companies uh, on that list. Uh, so, but China and the United States are the two leaders in many of the new technologies that are popping up. Well, you mentioned China and I, I and it brought to mind uh, my visits there, which date back quite a few years. And I can't begin to tell you how many times I would be in a bar or restaurant and go to pull out a credit card or money and they look at me like I was crazy. Everything's on the phone, everything. Um, it, I've never seen anyone in China under the age of 30 use cash or a credit card. No, it's, it's all mobile payments. Absolutely. Um, I guess in that sense, they're way out in front, aren't they? At least when it comes to mobile technology. In terms of mobile payment systems, they are way ahead of us. In terms of e-commerce, they have a bigger, per they have about twice the percentage, as is the case in the United States, of retail sales devoted to e-commerce, and that number is continuing to uh, grow. Uh, a few years ago when I was there, I was really impressed that, like, he, at, at that time when an American consumer would order something online, we'd be happy if we got it in two or three days, and there, they would expect it in two or three hours. Uh, so they were ahead on the delivery system. Now, American companies have caught up, like today you can actually uh, order something from an American e-commerce site, and I can get it a few hours uh, later. Uh, so it, it is good for countries to look at what is happening in other countries, just to learn from the good examples and try and avoid the bad examples. What about developing countries that already are kind of struggling with what's happening today, five years down the line? I mean, what's the distance that we're going to see? I mean, the worst case scenario is that technology has the potential to widen income inequality within individual countries, but also across countries. And so people should worry about what is happening in the developing world. Like just as in America, there are about 20% who are outside the digital revolution that don't have high speed uh, broadband. You know, we need to bring them along, make sure that they have access to these uh, technology benefits. The same thing is true in the developing world. There are countries around the world that actually don't have broadband, uh, that they have large parts of their population that are not able to use uh, computers and, and cell phones in the way that uh, we are today. It's bad for the world if there are billions of people who are left behind, if income inequality grows even more substantially than it is now, like this is a huge challenge for the world. And so the countries that are doing well, they need to be reaching out to the developing world, uh, engaging in uh, trade deals and uh, partnerships that bring digital technology to those countries because everybody needs to gain the benefits. And if that doesn't happen, we're gonna have more conflict and violence and problems in the world. Resiliency was key when cottage industries were replaced by industrial manufacturing. Darrell believes as we face the largest transformational technology of our lifetimes, it will be resiliency and adaptability that will help us to weather the upcoming storm. You know, you talked a little bit about reskilling. Um, obviously, people are going to have to, as you said, in your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, 60s, you're going to have to keep evolving. Uh, is reskilling going to be as important as resilience? Because I, I think about reskilling and, and we're seeing lightning fast changes in technology. And about the time you adapt to this one, there may be maybe another one uh, coming down the pipe. Can you talk about what are going to be, is resiliency going to be one of the most important skills? The capacity to recognize that there are more changes coming and you've got to be able to angle in that direction? Uh, how do you see, if I'm a, a worker, what advice would you give me? The two most important personal skills that people are going to need is one, resilience, uh, which you mentioned, and second, adaptability, because the pace of change is going to accelerate. It's gonna move even faster than what we think now, and we think it's moving pretty fast uh, right now. And so when I'm talking to young people, what I tell them is, you need to develop technical skills, but these personal skills of resilience and adaptability are also going to be very important because they're gonna be technologies that develop even within a relatively short time period that we may not even be aware of. There may be workforce ramifications that we don't yet see, but they may pop up 
two years from now. And so people need to be constantly scanning their environment, thinking about their job, looking at organizational changes, and anticipate what the changes are going to be and how it's going to affect them, and then how they need to adapt to that. Because the pace of technology innovation is going to continue regardless of how we feel about it. Daryl, fascinating conversation. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much.